How's everyone doing this morning? You ready to dive into this? Hey, let's take care of two things before I get into today's message. Um, So last week I told you that I'm starting an experiment where on the first Thursday of each month, 7 o'clock in the evening over in the student center, I'm going to be there. I'll host anybody who wants to discuss this most recent series of messages. All right, bring your questions. Tell me about things that didn't make sense, things that I didn't explain well enough. Tell me about things that you didn't understand how it applied to your life, and we'll talk about it. We'll figure it out. Anybody and everyone's invited first Thursday of every month at 7 o'clock over in the student center, and uh, it's, it's stripped down, all right? There's no, no worship band, um, no coffee and donuts unless you bring them, all right? It's just going to be us getting together to talk about the most recent series and what it is that we're learning together. Make sense? Second thing is, how many of you have a Bible? Maybe not here with you today, but how many of you have a Bible? Okay, a lot of you. Here's what I'd like to ask. Starting next Sunday, we begin a new series. It's gonna be a six-week series. I'd like to invite you to bring your Bible with you for the next six weeks. I'll explain why a little bit later, but I'd like to encourage all of us to bring your Bible. Now, if you don't have a Bible... We'd love to give you one. We have a gift that we would love to share with you. Just stop out at Information Central following the service, and we will make sure that you have a Bible. Now, if you have a Bible, but you just can't find it, look for it, all right? Look for it. Um, But if you don't have a Bible, we'd love to help you out with that. Make sense? Bring that for the next six weeks. All right. So uh, those are the things I just needed to get said. Let's let's jump into this um, conclusion of this series of messages that we've been in this month called The Great Adventure. Um, Now, here's here's the deal. You know, sometimes preaching is a little like taking a handful of flower seeds, throwing it up in the wind, and then walking away. And you're never really sure where it all lands or if it ever makes, you know, roots or if it ever produces flowers. You just never really know. And this, this series has been a little like that because I'm offering us to consider something for the year 2022, and I don't know if it's hitting, I don't know if it's registering, but here's been the purpose, that I believe that the perspective that we have influences how we experience life. And so if you have a negative perspective, you'll probably experience life in very negative ways. If you have a very positive perspective, perspective, you'll generally encounter life from a very positive kind of way. Well, I believe the same holds true with our spiritual journey, following Jesus, uh, being a Christian, whatever words you might use. Our perspective and how we encounter that is absolutely critical. And so I would like to suggest for the year 2022 that all of us challenge our current perspective, and here's what I'd like you to consider, that following Jesus is an adventure because it's a journey of faith. Faith by nature is mysterious. It's rooted in the realm of impossible. And so we can't anticipate everything about following Jesus. We won't have answers to all of our questions. There may be things in the bends of the road that we could never ever anticipate, but that's the adventure of going on a journey of following Jesus Christ. When we think of following Jesus, okay, if we have a improper perspective. When we think of following Jesus only as some religious obligation, like these things I have to do, I have to go to church, I have to read my Bible, I have to say my prayers, I have to put money in the offering plate, I have to, you know, volunteer. If we look at it as some religious obligation or worse, some religious performance where I have to do these things in order to earn points so God will like me and if I earn enough points, I'll get to go to heaven when I die. What I'll tell you is you're more than likely to find that a spiritual journey is frustrating, disappointing, and even eventually disillusioning. If this is your perspective on what it means to follow Jesus, there will come a time in your life where you just throw your hands and go, you know what, it's not worth the trouble. It doesn't work. So there's another perspective. When we think of following Jesus as an adventure, an adventure that's full of questions and mysteries, and at times it can be uncomfortable and there's lots of risk associated with it, what I know is that it becomes far more interesting, engaging, and life-giving. 
You see, when we're on the edge of risk, we tend to be a bit more engaged. If you've ever jumped out of an airplane to go skydiving, I would imagine when you're standing in the doorway getting ready to leap, I bet you you're all in. I bet you you're really locked into what's going on. So what if we could think of our spiritual journey of following Jesus as an adventure? It's going to be far more interesting and engaging and in the end, far more life-giving. Jesus said, I have come that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly. And we looked at that in the series so far. And that word abundant or full means to be uncommon or beyond expectations. Jesus came to offer us an experience of life that goes beyond what normal or typical people without Christ would experience. But here's the deal. There's nothing abundant about a faith that's boring and complacent because we refuse to venture out into different or uncomfortable. Does that make sense? So what's the first first rule of adventure? This is week three of this now. First rule of adventure is adventure always happens outside of your comfort zone. So outside of your comfort zone, questions are inevitable. Uncertainty is the only thing that's certain. Risk is expected and nervous is normal. What if that was how we anticipated that a journey of following when Jesus would be like? It would change the game. So over the last three weeks, we've looked, at, um, we've looked at a couple of the adventures that Jesus may take us on. Now, these are just one of literally probably hundreds of different adventures that Christ may take us on. Some of them will be unique and personal to you as God works in your life for what he's preparing you for. But here's some of the adventures we looked at. We looked at the adventure of surrender, turning our lives over completely to what we are and what we want and what we hope, turning that over and trusting God with our lives. We talked about the adventure of forgiveness last week. So today I wanna talk about another adventure. You guys ready? I wanna talk about the adventure of trust. Now you might think, well, that doesn't sound all that exciting. So let's dial it in a little tighter. Let's talk about specifically the adventure of overcoming worry. Because that hits a little closer to home. Right? All right, so what is worry? Worry is a state of mental distress or agitation due to concern about an impending or anticipated event threat or danger. It's kind of a common definition. Another one that I read went this. Worry is distress caused by something that you might possibly experience in the future. And left unchecked, it can have effects on both your physical and mental health. Now, I read probably two dozen different definitions of what is most commonly understood as worry, and I saw two ingredients. It's usually some sort of emotional or mental distress, some sort of anxiety, concern, some sort of of feelings of impending danger, and that's the second feature, is that it's almost always related to something that hasn't even happened yet. So, a couple weeks ago, I I said to my wife, Charlotte, "Um, I think I'm getting old. And she rolled her eyes and laughed at me, I get that a lot. She said, why do you think you're getting old? I said, I could name like six reasons right off the top of my head. She goes, okay, just tell me some of them. I said, the first, I can't hear anything anymore. I can't hear anything in a restaurant. I can't always make out what the TV's saying. Sometimes I can't hear you, but I can hear the impatience in your voice when you've had to repeat yourself the third time. I hear that. I'm the guy who's driving down straight down the highway with my blinker on because I can't hear the blinker blinking? And she goes, yeah, you do that. She goes, what else? I go, do you really want to know honest truth? Okay, this may be TMI. I said, I'm getting old because I can't sleep through the entire night without having to make two or three rest stops. I mean, what's up with that? Here's another reason why I feel like I'm getting old. I can't stand being cold. If it drops below 50 degrees, I'm like whining about how cold it is. 
My feet are cold. My hands are cold. My ears are cold. My back's cold. I walk around the house like this. I come home. I put on a sweater like I'm Mr. Rogers or something. If it's anywhere near 40 degrees outside, I'm not doing anything outside. In fact, I'm not doing anything inside if it's 40 degrees outside. Here's something else. I'm becoming less and less tolerant of people telling me how to live my life, (laughs) how to do my job, what I can and can't do on social media. I'm like, hey, you do you, I'll do me, and we'll be fine. We'll both answer for our own lives, okay? Can we just... But here's the thing that's really got me wrapped around the axle. Suddenly, I am worrying about things I've never worried about before in my life. Like I used to pride myself in the fact that I wasn't a worrier. And I used to be confused by people who seemed to worry all the time. And like, don't borrow trouble. I was just so chill about life. But the last couple of years, I find myself worrying about things. In fact, I have like these sudden images that come into my head, like the worst thing that could happen. And I worry about my wife and my sons, and I worry about my job, and I worry about my health, and I worry about things going on in the world. And I'm like, what in the world is that? And the truth is, there's no shortage of things to worry about these days. Am I right? I mean, here's just a list. This is a short list. Health, it's like we have an entire world right now that's worried about their health or somebody else's health. We worry about finances, unprecedented inflation right now, our paychecks aren't going nearly as far as they used to. We worry about our job or the long arch of our career. We worry about our children. I did a wedding last night and the bride of the mom was doing a toast and she was talking about being a single mom to a, a one child and how she worried all the time about her daughter and here she was handing her off to somebody else to worry about, all right? Um, she wor- we worry about our family, not just the one that lives under our roof, but our extended family. We worry about friendships, lots of things going on in the world that create a lot of worry, what's going on in government. We worry about our marriages, Even when they're going really, really well, we worry about our marriages and about dangers in life, crime, the lifestyle and losing it, or possessions and how to uh, keep them. We worry about things that we see in culture, or is that just me? There's just one (laughs) problem. Thank you. Could I have an usher to see this gentleman out? But there's just one problem. There's just one problem. While there are certainly many things to worry about these days, the Bible clearly instructs that Christ followers are not to worry about any of them. Like none of them. I mean, Jesus says, do not worry about your life. The Apostle Paul wrote the early church, do not be anxious about anything. And we read instructions like that in the scriptures and we pull our hair out and we think, well, God doesn't get it. God doesn't understand, so listen to ourselves. God doesn't get it? Maybe God gets it just fine and it's you and I that don't really understand what that's all about. So what is worry from God's perspective? Want to know it in one word? Worry is fear. There's a a family of words. And we talk about being cautious or careful. That is a degree of fear, but it's a constructive or helpful degree of fear. It's it's wise to be cautious and careful in some situations. We can, we can talk about a growing sense of caution where you get concerned about the risk that we're facing or the danger that might uh, result. Then worry is a next level of fear. That's when I'm starting to imagine the things that could go wrong. And then we talk about frightened. That's like literally scared. And then 
The ultimate expression of fear is to be petrified. You're paralyzed by the degree of fear that you're facing. So what I want you to understand is that worry falls into a family of words related to fear. So here's the first thing I want you to understand about worry. And it's this. Worry is an indication that I'm afraid. Are you listening to me? Here's what I want you to understand. There's nothing wrong with being afraid. But unfortunately, in our society, worry doesn't get quite raised to the level of seriousness that it poses. In fact, most of us, we think of worry as no big deal. We think of worry as sort of socially acceptable. We actually laugh it off. We say, oh, I'm just a worrywart. Yeah, my mom was a worrier, and she taught that to me. And so I'm a worrier. That's just the way I am. I'm just a worrier. But if we understand what worry really is, it's fear, then the terms worry wart and worrier are far more socially acceptable than scaredy cat and big chicken. Because that's what we're saying. That maybe the first step to overcoming worry is to start calling it for what it is. I'm afraid. To admit that I'm afraid, not out of a sense of shame, but to admit that I'm afraid out of a place of need. I'm afraid I need something. So it's interesting, in our Old Testament, we have an entire book of the Bible, the book of Psalms, which is people in many of the Psalms expressing what they're afraid of and how they're afraid. A whole book in the Bible about people being afraid at times and asking for some help. Here's just a little side note that might be helpful in your marriage. Husbands and wives, don't diminish your partner's fears. They may say that they're worried about something, and you may not understand it, and you may think, oh, quit your worry, and half of it never comes true, and you sort of diminish them saying that they are worried. And what, what I'd encourage you to do as a more constructive or healthy approach is to ask them, Honey, what are you afraid of? Listen to them. Understand their fear. And then help them navigate their way through it. Does that make sense? So here's one of the most honest prayers that we can ever pray. And I'll I'll just tell you, God loves honest prayers. And here's one of the most honest prayers you can pray. God I'm afraid right now. I'm afraid about the choices my teenager's making. I'm afraid about what the economy means to our career. God, I'm afraid about that test I got back from the doctor. One of the first steps to addressing the place of worry in our life is to name it for what it is. It's about being afraid. But there's something more. And here's the second thing I want us to understand about worry, is worry is an indication that I don't trust God. You see, the number one thing that God's been inviting us to do throughout all of history is to trust him. He keeps saying over and over and over again in a million different ways, will you trust me? Will you trust me? Will you trust me? From the Garden of Eden all the way to the cross, God is asking people, will you trust me? From the resurrection to the long arch of history that brings us to this day, God is asking the same question, will you trust me? So trust Trust is built on a couple of dimensions that we understand about God. Trust is, first of all, it's built on the nature of God. It's like who God is by nature. He's omniscient. He knows everything. He's omnipotent. He's all-powerful. He's eternal. He's sovereign. These are the nature of God that we can place our trust in. This isn't his first rodeo. 
Another part that we trust about God's uh, dimension of God that we trust is his character. He has these attributes, these virtues that, that de um, describe him. He's loving, and he's kind, and he's loyal. This is the nature of God and the character of God that we can place our trust in. God has made numerous promises based on his nature and his character. God has made promises that we can trust. And he's given instructions based on his nature and his character and the promises he's made. He said, trust me, if you'll live your life this way, if you'll live your life these ways, I will see you through whatever you may be afraid of. Here's just some, some of the promises. Jesus said, I will never, I'll never leave you. I'm never going to forsake you. When you feel like I'm so far away, what you need to understand by faith is I'm never absent. I'm always right there. Look at this promise. My God will supply all of your, what? your needs, according to the riches in glory in Christ Jesus. In other words, he has unlimited amounts of meeting your needs. He can do whatever it is that you need. With God, nothing's impossible. That broken marriage, the thought of restoration, nothing's impossible. Nothing is impossible for a God who's created the universe. Romans chapter eight, nothing, there isn't anything that can separate us from the love of God. I don't care how many times you've done that thing that you know to be wrong. I don't care how much of that grip of addiction has on your life. There isn't anything that can separate you from the love of God. That's a promise. And we learn to live our lives trusting what we know to be true about God, or at least that's the adventure. Folks, this is one of the reasons why it's so important that we read and study and memorize the scriptures because what we're doing is we're building a base of knowledge upon which we construct a faith that we believe. We're getting to know the character of God, the nature of God. We're getting to find the promises of God and we're understanding the wisdom in his instructions. So it's interesting, all throughout the Bible, we see examples of real people in real situations that were really dangerous and really threatening and really risky. And God's inviting those people that we see in the Bible to, in, to trust him. And here's what we find. Some of them do and some of them don't. But it's interesting. If you follow every one of these examples of people being invited to trust God and the ones who choose to trust God in really overwhelming situations. Are you with me? If you follow each of those examples, what you find is there's another family of words that are common to every one of those examples. And the words look like this. Wait. For the person who's in the midst of an overwhelming situation and everybody is around them going, why aren't you doing something about this? Person of faith goes, I'm waiting on God to defend me. I'm waiting on God to provide my need, not what I want. I'm waiting to God to come alongside and provide for whatever the situation calls for. It's not some panic waiting, like where in the world is God? No, we're, we're waiting, trusting that God's timing is perfect. We run into the word rest. It's the, it's the tranquility of our soul because we trust that God's made promises that he'll be faithful to. Still, be still and know that I'm God. Relax and rest in what you know to be true about God. The word peace, the word hope, the, uh, that's not wishful thinking. That's a confidence, an abiding confidence that comes with trusting God, knowing that he will take care of us. Does that make sense? So to trust God is I completely depend on him, confident he'll take care of me at all times in every circumstance. 
So here's the truth. That the minute we start worrying about something, we're no longer trusting God. They're not compatible, which is a really interesting study. You see, worry is saying this. I don't think God's, I think God's just going to leave me hanging out here. That's what we're saying when we worry. We're thinking that God is going to forget some important detail. We, we think that God's going to lose me in the crowd. I mean, it's like, what, seven billion people in the earth. Surely he'll oversee, he'll overlook my circumstance. We, we think that he's going to be late. We, we think that he's going to fail to come through. Some of us, we think that God just doesn't care about our unique situation, or worse, that because we haven't always behaved the way like we think we should, that God's just going to do something mean or cruel to us. So look at that. Why is it that we think those things of God? Be honest. The reason that we look at those things and think of them as what God might do, so I'm going to worry about it, is because, you ready? Because we're projecting. We're projecting on God the things that are true about our own limitations. You see, the truth of the matter is we've left some people hanging from time to time. Or we've missed an important detail along the way. Or we were late in coming through for somebody. Or at times we haven't cared to the degree that we should have. So here's what we're doing. We're projecting on God our own sense of limitations. So what have we done? We've made God like us. We've created God in our image. And when God's just like us, he can't help us. He will miss details. He would be late. But that's the amazing thing of God is that he is not anything like us. So he's never late. And he never misses important details. And he always cares. And please understand, he doesn't do mean things to get back at you. It's not his nature. It's not in his character. So it's coming to trust who God is that allows us to look at what's overwhelming and challenging in life and trust that God's going to walk me through this and I don't have to live in the paralyzing fear of worry. Does that make sense? So... Second most honest prayer. You ready? God, I don't trust you right now. God, my worry is telling me I don't trust you right now. Probably about, I'm going to say eight years ago, I started being honest to my own worries. And I've started praying this prayer. God, I'm sorry, but I'm not trusting you right now. I need your help in understanding more about how I can trust you in this situation. And here's the beautiful thing. Is God speaks in the scriptures about how we come to trust him. Here's just um, two of the premier passages in the New Testament that address the issue of worry. Matthew chapter 6, Jesus says, I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, about your body and what you will wear. It's like all those normal everyday needs and concerns that you have. He says, don't worry about them. Is life not more than food? Is the body more than clothes? And the answer is yes. Jesus says, well, look at the birds of the air. They don't sow or reap or store away in barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. And then he asks a question, are you not much more valuable than the birds? And the answer is yes. You're far more valuable than the creatures of the earth. Can any one of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your life? <laughs> no, you can't. So why do you worry about clothes? See how the flowers of the field, they do not labor or spin, yet I tell you, 
Jesus, I tell you that even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown in the fire, in other words, it's temporary, will he not much more clothe you? You of little trust. Why are you worrying about these things? So do not worry saying, oh, what shall we eat or what shall we drink or what shall we wear or, or what if I lose my job or what if, or, or what if all this future imagination of things that could possibly go wrong creating stress. Next line. Let that sink in. For the pagans run after these things. What is Jesus saying? He's saying people who don't include God in the equation of their life, they worry about stuff. Because they don't have hope. They don't have peace. They don't have rest. They have nobody to wait on. So they live in the fear of everything that could go wrong. But if you're going to be a follower of Jesus, in contrast to the pagans, Jesus is saying, don't worry about your life. I've got you. I'm going to take care of all your needs. Your father knows that you need them. But here's the thing that I'd rather you do is to seek first his kingdom, God's kingdom, and his righteousness, and all these other things that we worry about They'll be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of his own. Learn to trust me. Here's another passage. Rejoice in the Lord when you feel like it. It doesn't say that, does it? Rejoice in the Lord when you're hitting it out of the park and everything's going well. No, it's rejoice in the Lord always. And I'll say it again so you don't miss it. Rejoice. I love this. Let your gentleness. You know what gentleness is? That's calm, cool, collected spirit that rests in the assurance that my God will provide all of my needs. I don't have to be running around panicked about it. Let your gentleness be evident to all. Why? Promise. Because the Lord is near. He's right here. He's right here in the job search. He's right here in the test at the doctors. He's right here when your child is late. He's right here. So don't worry. What was one of the things that we've been talking about is that perspective shapes attitude. So the perspective is the Lord is near. It shapes an attitude that lets gentleness and rejoicing characterize our life. The passage continues. Do not be anxious about anything. Like everything's off the table to worry about. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation. I don't care what it is. In every situation, by prayer, petition, with thanksgiving, here's what you should do. You should present your request to God. God, I'm afraid. God, I need your help. God, I'm not trusting you right now. Show me how I can trust you. And look what the reward is, or look what the outcome is. The peace of God, which transcends all understanding, meaning it's really hard to explain how the peace of God invades a worried soul if we'll pray with thanksgiving. It'll guard your heart and your mind in Christ Jesus. Remember in the first week of this series, we talked about time and energy? How you distribute your time and how you distribute your energy will tell the story of your life. So what if we spent time and energy rather than worrying, we spent time and energy praying with thanksgiving? That's where we directed our energy. Toward what? The one thing that can help us as opposed to worry, which cannot help at all. Passage continues. Finally, brothers and sisters, 
Whatever's true, whatever's noble, whatever's right, was pure, lovely, admirable, if anything's excellent or praiseworthy, think about those things. Whatever you've learned or received or heard from me and seen in me, put into practice and the God of peace will be with you. Do you remember talking in the series about think, choose, do? That everything that we do is a reflection of choices that we make, which is influenced by our thinking. The scriptures is giving us what to think about, and if we'll practice those things, they'll become habits in the way that we experience life. It's amazing how it all works. So God has given us the one way to tackle worry, and that is to pray with thanksgiving. So what if? What if every time you started to worry about the thing that you worry about, instead of worrying about it, you turn that energy into prayer? Thanking God for what it is that's creating the worry in your life. Turning it over to him and thanking him for whatever the situation is and what you might have to learn from it and what it is that he's up to in shaping you to become a stronger, more trusting follower of Jesus. Now here's the deal. If we're going to be honest, some of you, you're a bit more inclined to worry than most. So you may have to pray that prayer of thanksgiving a million times a day, every day, until what? Till your mind and your heart starts to believe that worry is not going to help. But God can. Oh, man, I wish we had time. I wish we had time to explain the amazing way that the brain works. The brain is like a forest of trees, and the branches overlap, and vital thoughts that make our life work go across those branches. So if we start shaping a bridge of trees in our mind that every time fear surfaces in our life, we react to it in prayer with thanksgiving, those branches will eventually connect, and that will become your way of faith. Does that make sense? I can tell you more about that Thursday night, 7 o'clock, if you're interested. So let me close with this. I have a, I have a good friend I've known for over 30 years. Um, he's an elementary school teacher. He's the kind of guy that every parent in this room who has a kindergartner, you would want him to be your kid's teacher. Compassionate heart, loves his students, loves his students' families. He loves teaching. He's been doing it for three decades. He contacted me a couple months ago. He said, Paul, I was wondering if you'd pray for me. Um, The school district that I serve in is trying to make some decisions about whether teachers need to be vaccinated or not, whether they need to be boosted or not. He said, they haven't made a decision yet. They're just, they've informed us that they're working on it. And I'm concerned because I know a little bit about what's happening in the country and I know a little bit about what's happening in my state. And I know a little bit about my health history. I'm choosing not to be vaccinated. I said, I'll be praying for you. If there's any way I can help, let me know. Keep, keep in touch. So a couple weeks later, he contacted me again. He said, um, the school district has made the decision that all the teachers need to be vaccinated and boosted or we can't work there any longer. But they've given me an extension. So I'll just have to wait and see if anything changes. Last week, he reached out to me to tell me that he had been terminated from his job. And he was heartbroken. He cried at the thought of not being there for his kids on report card day for the first time in like 30 years. 
And I reached out to him, and I wanted him to know that I was praying for him. And I wanted him to know that some friends of mine who had shared the story with, they were praying for him too. And he made an interesting comment. He said, thank you. I need all the prayers I can get right now because I'm having trouble getting out from underneath my bed. Now, I think that was figurative language to say, I'm really discouraged. And I'm really afraid because this is how I make a living for my family. And I don't know what else I'll do. And I wrote back to him and I said, I want to encourage you to walk tall. I want to encourage you to walk tall because as a believer in Jesus Christ, as a Christian, we are to live by faith, not by sight. So I want you to walk tall in the decision that you've made that best reflects your conscience in a very difficult situation. I want you to rest in the fact that God will provide for you and your family's needs. And then I shared this with him. Faith is confidence, and faith is courage, that when I truly trust God to hold my life in his hands and to meet all of my needs, then when life seems overwhelming, I can be the one person in the room who steps toward it with confidence and courage, knowing that I'm a child of God. He will never leave me or forsake me. He will meet all of my needs. There's nothing that I will do or anybody else will do that will ever separate me from the love of God. And the truth is, worthy is uh, worry is neither of those. Worry is fear. Faith is confidence and courage. That's why we can read in the 23rd Psalm that even though I walk through something as dangerous and scary as the valley of the shadow of death, I'll fear no evil. Why? Because my shepherd guards me. So maybe, maybe this prayer could be yours for the next several weeks. The prayer is this, search me, God. Know my heart, test me, and know my anxious thoughts because that's not how I want to live my life anymore. Make sense? A lot to think about. Let me ask you to stand together. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we read some amazing stories in the pages of the Bible of people who did some incredible things. Some people who experienced miraculous turns of events because they had just enough faith to not step back in fear, but to step out in courage and a confidence that you would meet them right where they were. God, those stories were shared so that our faith here in the 21st century would be bolstered. God, my prayer for this church, my prayer for this church is that they won't just stay stories in the Bible the men and women of Sibylla Creek Community Church, the students and the children of Sibylla Creek Community Church would be a people of such great faith that we'd be the one person in the room full of confidence and courage, not in our own sufficiency, but in our trust of the eternal living God. Make us a people who live by faith not by sight, whose lives are not consumed with worry, but bolstered in trust. Do that work in our midst, I pray and ask in the name of Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen.
All right, gang. See you next Sunday. Have a great week.